This is Ronnie Odom with Navigate Housing. Thank you so much for joining us for Wednesday's Wisdom. Today I have the pleasure of talking with Vicki Bell. She is our corporate trainer. She also um, has a very successful YouTube series called Tuesday's Tips. I'm sure most of you have seen it. Thank you, Vicki, for joining me. Thank you for inviting me, Ronnie. We're going to talk today about reasonable accommodation. But first, I want Vicki to tell you a little bit about her housing experience and, um, and especially her experience in dealing with fair housing issues. Well, my housing experience goes way back when, so we won't go that far back. We don't have <laughs> enough time. But let me say that my passion is fair housing. And it's fair housing for the simple reason that it is the law and it's the right thing to do. Great. Um, let's talk about reasonable accommodation. Um, okay. Can you give me sort of a general definition of reasonable accommodation? Well, reasonable accommodations are part of the 504 compliance with fair housing. And what it is, is there are seven protected classes. One of those classes is disability. Mm -hmm. And the reasonable accommodations come up under disability. And what it simply means is that an owner or a landlord will accommodate a person, give them accommodation so that they can live and utilize the property or the program as anyone else would that did not have a disability. Mm -hmm. And that's an accommodation of their policies? It's accommodation of their policies and facilities. And facility. Okay. Yes. So like a good example of that would be um, if you have a client who is in a wheelchair and um, and you have a policy that you don't assign um, handicapped spaces at the beginning or at the at that part of the of the of the development. So, say in front of that person's house, you don't have a handicapped parking assigned. So, as a reasonable accommodation, you could actually assign a space for that person. What's another good example of a reasonable accommodation that we would see in public housing? Well, there are several. The most common would be assistance animals. Okay. Um, they are called assistance animals, therapy animals, service animals, but they all fall up under the same umbrella. Mm -hmm. Most owners have a policy that says no pets. Mm -hmm. These animals are not considered as pets. They have a duty. They're also called emotional support animals. Sometimes it's off well, often it's hard to tell if a person has a disability or not. There are certain disabilities that we could see with the visible eye, such as a missing limb mm -hmm. or a person on oxygen or in a wheelchair, mm -hmm. as you just gave an example. But there are other disability-related issues that you can't see with the visible eye. Mm -hmm. And uh, a doctor might say that a elderly person needs an emotional support animal because they might have dementia or it causes them to focus or makes them feel better. Mm -hmm. A lot of times the owners or management wants to say, no, you can't have one. But that's against the fair housing law. If they can show reason that they need one to the doctor and the doctor prescribes an emotional support animal or an animal to help them for a mental disability, a physical disability, or whatever type of disability, then the law says you have to allow them to have one. Okay. And the law also says you can't ask them about the nature of that disability. Mm -hmm. So while we're on the assisted animal, let's talk about, let's carry that a little bit further. So um, if that person qualifies for a medical deduction, what, how would that be related to the assisted animal? And then if that animal causes damages to the unit when that person moves out, how would that be handled? Well, I want everybody to keep in mind that it's not a pet, mm -hmm. but there are certain costs that are associated with mm -hmm. the animal. The animal has to have shots, the animal has to have food, anything that will keep the animal alive and healthy, mm -hmm. they can deduct as a medical deduction. Mm -hmm as the same as they would the penicillin or the diabetes medicine or any other type of medicine. However, Fufu cannot have a raincoat or rain <laughs> boots. Those things doesn't allow you to count off as a medical expense. Also remember that the animal has to be on a lease 
and the leash has to permit him to go into certain areas, even the common areas, but they can't just roam the property at will. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there was a phone call you got last week or a week before about um, someone bringing their animal into like a community room where they were having a party or a dinner. You want to tell us what that advice was? Well, we got a phone call saying that this person's assistance animal is coming down to the common area to the dinner table and sitting in the resident's lap as they eat. And it was disturbing or bothering the rest of the residents. And the advice was that unless there was something that said or barred the animal from the common area, that there was nothing that management could really do unless they wanted to give another table. The residents who it bothered could sit at another table. They wouldn't have to sit at the table with Mrs. Smith if her animal eating out of her plate bothered them. But the animal was not disturbing the peace or enjoyment or the safety of any of the other residents, so there was no need to bar the animal from the common area. Mm -hmm. And then one thing I'd like to add too is that I've seen at housing authorities where someone has actually come into the office and said, I need a reasonable accommodation, I'm disabled, I need blah, 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 blah. And then the receptionist, who may not have had um, you know, full fair housing experience or training, would say, oh, you have to put this on our form. Um, well, it's good to have it on your form and it's really good and advisable to have it in writing, but you want to talk about that, whether or not just that person speaking on it is enough in the eyes of the court um, before you act. Well, I, I agree with you. It's always best to have anything in writing mm -hmm. if you could get it in writing, but uh, sometimes you're unable to get things in writing and you or the courts rely upon the residents word that it happened. Mm -hmm. When I was managing property, my advice to my managers that were up under me was that the Legal Aid Society will take our residents' complaints and they will pursue them at no cost to the residents. However, management has to retain an attorney and pay that attorney for the time that they're being retained to settle a frivolous lawsuit. So mm -hmm. it, it's, it's best not to even get involved mm -hmm. in one. You mentioned the different things under reasonable accommodations. Parking spaces are one, as you mentioned. So often, management feels that I'll start a avalanche of people coming down wanting a particular parking space. But if a resident brings you something from the doctor that says Miss Bell needs a parking space that's within 600 feet of her door, then you have to grant that parking space. Mm -hmm. Someone else says, well, we have handicapped parking. Why can't they use that space? There are um, court cases out there where a resident was low on air, oxygen, could not breathe, had some type of lung disease could not walk a good distance. And so the assigned handicap parking space, that's the spaces with the little blue stripes and the little handicap uh, wheelchair, was further than she was allowed to walk. Mm -hmm. So the reasonable accommodation allowed her to be able to exit her car into her residence without giving out a threat. I just caution everyone to take your reasonable accommodations in mind and if you can, grant those accommodations because they'll save you in the long run in terms of cost. Right. And sometimes the request may not be reasonable. And this is where um, you really need to get legal advice. So um, there are a few times when things may not meet the definition. So first of all, it has, the request has to be made for the person with the, either for or by the person with the disability. And it has to be related to the disability. Um, and it cannot cause undue financial or administrative um, burdens. Sorry, we just had an ambulance go by. This is the real world for us. <laughs> We're in downtown Birmingham. Um, but it cannot cause an undue financial and administrative burden, burden on the housing authority. So, for example, if you have someone who came in and um, 
and said, look, I have a disability and, and I'm really short of breath, um, like they could just describe. And I need you guys to go grocery shopping for me every Tuesday at three o'clock. Well, that's unreasonable, especially if you're a small housing authority with two or three people working at the agency. So that would be um, an unreasonable request. But what you could do and what you should do is get into contact with a social service agency that will provide that kind of services for them. Vicki, thank you so much for your time today. And Vicki, um, I'm gonna invite her back several times to talk about other fair housing issues. So thank you for joining us for Wednesday's Wisdom, and we'll see you again soon.